We must take action now. The most alarming climate warning yet from UN scientists, but are world leaders paying attention? Campaigning gets intense for the competing measures to develop the Mission Valley Stadium site. And who's backing Prop 6, the effort to repeal the state's gas tax? If you follow the money, much of it centers on San Diego. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer. And joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today, Ram Ramanathan, Distinguished Professor of Climate Sciences at the University of California, San Diego, Eric Anderson, who covers business and the environment for KPBS News, reporter Rai Rabard of Voice of San Diego, and reporter Jill Castellano of iNewsource. Well, a bitter Supreme Court fight crashing stock prices claims the Saudis murdered a journalist. These headlines crowded front pages this week, along with the latest in a series of devastating hurricanes. Storm headlines are more to the point because a United Nations report on climate change, a screeching alarm to all world leaders, got largely drowned out. What's at stake? Nothing less than all living things, life on the planet as we know it. And I don't think we can overstate this. Uh, Ron, start with that report. Uh, what, uh, what were the key findings and who were the scientists that, uh, that did it? This is an international group of you know, over 100 scientists. And they are part of another international group of about 1,000 scientists. So every five years or so, they do an annual checkup of the health of the planet and release a report. And so this follows about uh, six years since the last one was done. And what was most significant and new about this report, they talk about what's going to happen when you let the planet temperature heat up more than a degree and a half Celsius. <coughs> so mind you, the planet has already warmed up by a degree, and that we already see have made our fires more intense, hurricanes more intense. Big storm in Florida. Big storm and through Florida. The south you know, we have never had a, a Category Four storm travel that far inland north, but it's happening. And we know from basic physics, it's because of climate change. So the question is, they said, if we let the planet warm by another half a degree. We're already at one to one and a half. What's going to happen? And they sort of list a lot of bad things that's going to happen. And what that came as a warning to us is that in the Paris summit, that was three years ago, I was uh, there as part of Pope Francis's Holy See delegation. There we said, we need to keep the warming under two degrees. This support now says, no, 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 that's too much. So we have to keep it at one and a half or below. Well, let me just tell you one th bad thing that could happen, that if you let it go from one and a half to two degrees, an additional 1.7 billion people would be exposed to extremes, heat extremes, floods, droughts. So the thing I, I, I want... And all the human conflict that goes with that. And the, uh, the thing we need to know, uh, this panel and our public, we are not talking anymore about 10 million people, 100 million. We are talking about one and a half billion. We're in the billions now. Now you and your uh, two colleagues also this week uh, did an article that said this was actually a cautious report, as, as strong and urgent as it is, uh, and why so? You say that there's effects it didn't really take into account. Dire as it is, or it was, this report, they missed some major things. They're talking about one and a half degree warming happening between 2030 to 2050. No, we're talking about this happening in 10 to 12 years, just around the corner. They try, tend to be more cautious, the other thing they miss sort of completely is there are so many what we call feedbacks. Just to give you one example, the Arctic is retreating, that is the summertime Arctic, almost 40%. When it does that, 
it exposes the darker ocean which soaks in enormous amount of sunlight and we have shown a study done at Scripps here by my student and other scientists and myself that extra heat added is equal to adding another 250 billion tons of CO2. So there are many such feedbacks, one by one they could fall like dominoes. So we don't even have the tools to predict how that planet would look like. Right. Well, I want to bring it back home here to San Diego, Rai, you did a story this week, rapid climate change, what it might look like in the county. What are the, some of the findings there? Uh, we're between a frying pan and a fire. On the west coast, you'll see the Pacific is rising, um, so that'll start nuisance flooding. Um, but then, you know, in the low-lying areas, Coronado, Imperial Beach, around San Diego Bay, which is where downtown San Diego is, you know, under some scenarios, hundreds of millions of dollars of infrastructure damage annually. Um, to our east, we've already started to see uh, more wildfires. Uh, we're going to see more of those, just as we're putting thousands of new homes out there. And then from Coronado to Calexico, you're going to see temperature increases 5 to 10 degrees. That means, you know, the hottest day of the year by the coast is 100. Hottest day inland is about 115. That's, so that's now. Suddenly that's going to be 110, 125. Right. And we've already seen, uh, you know, it's hotter longer periods of time, hotter longer into the evening and overnight. That, that's going to just keep getting worse. Jill? Right. What is San Diego County doing about this? What are they doing right now, knowing that this could be coming? Uh, there's some differences. Uh, the city is moving fairly aggressively to do its part. It has a climate action plan. Technically, everybody has a climate action plan, but the county's climate action plan has been repeatedly questioned um, by environmentalists and by the courts. Uh, so, arguably, the city's doing something. The county is not doing that much. And, Ram, I want to get back to this whole notion of cost. And, and in your uh, article, you talked about uh, you were fairly optimistic, which kind of surprised me given the, the uh, urgency of this. But uh, how do you how do you figure the cost, what it might be, and how do you get world leaders on board, including religious leaders? Uh, the key thing, uh, let me address first, in that cost, why I'm so excited about what San Diego is doing. If the whole world follows San Diego's goals, having electricity carbon neutral by 2035, and cutting our greenhouse gas emissions by 50% in over 30 years, if the rest of the world follows that, we would have solved about 70% of the climate change problem. Just that. So we could really be world leaders. So we, particularly with a Republican mayor, we would become the living laboratory for the rest of the planet. So it's huge. So let me tell you, in terms of the cost, there are three levers we have to pull. First is, the carbon lever. We have to become uh, carbon neutral in about 30 years. The cost of that for the whole world to do that is about a trillion dollars per year for the next 30 years. It may look like a huge amount, but if it has to be borne by all the world's nations, just divide that cost by the richest one billion. It's about a $400 problem per year. So, so you're optimistic. That's why I'm optimistic, and I'm optimistic because San Diego is leading the charge well, you and got, the state. you got leaders here and in California, but what about leaders throughout the Middle East? What about leaders in other Western countries? What about leaders in Washington, D.C.? Where? Uh, let me deal with the easy ones first. <laughs> Washington, D.C., I'm going to let my colleagues address that. <laughs> Sweden, doing exactly like what we are doing. Germany one-third of their power comes from solar. They are living far north. And they don't get the sun that we get. Yes, exactly. China, again, has decided to bend their curve. India. So there are these shining examples. But at the same time, I want to be careful. I don't want to paint a rosy picture. We are far from where we need to be, and we need to start it now. Well, we do have a bite here from President Trump, who uh, re reacting to this UN report this week. Let's let's hear that. Have you read the UN report this week, uh, warning about climate change, uh, requiring drastic action? It to was given to me. It was yeah. given to me, and I want to look at who drew it. You know, which group drew it, because I couldn't give you reports that are fabulous, and I can give you reports that aren't so good. But I will be looking at it, absolutely. Maybe we've got more pictures there. Uh, fabulous reports? I don't think so. 
I defer to my colleague here <laughs> from the media. Sure. It'd be nice. It'd be nice to, to, to jump in and, and have an opinion uh, about that and the direction of the federal government. I think that um, what has struck me about uh, how we view the climate situation uh, is how, uh, among the scientific community, the, sh the view has sort of shifted. Uh, the range of op options for us, the range of outcomes for us, have narrowed. Um, they used to be broad. They used to be this, uh, uh, you know, as, as recently as a couple of years ago, we were looking at options on sea level change, for example, where we would have a low impact option, a medium impact, and a severe impact option. And it seems like the low and the medium impact options are not really realistic, that we're dealing with the severe impact or higher. Um, I was speaking with uh, Dr. Helen Frick at Scripps, who studies the melting of the ice cores at both of the poles. A and she has been surprised at how quickly it's happening, much quicker than she thought. And that has a direct impact on San Diego because the ocean level here will rise much quicker than generally expected. And then we have a lot of those uh, yes. coastal impacts. All right, unfortunately, we're out of time on this topic. I'd love to keep going, and we will be doing more on this, especially we've got an election year now, and especially as we move into a presidential election year just next year. We'll see what happens if this gets national traction with our leaders. Well, in November, we find out what deciding a major land use issue via the ballot box looks like. Competing plans for developing the massive Mission Valley Stadium site go before voters, and campaigns are in full swing. And, and Eric, start with the uh, overview of these two plans out there competing for the uh, stadium site. Yeah, this is a full season for political ads, right? So um, what, the, what these two ideas are, one is backed by a group of investors in La Jolla, FS investors. They want to redevelop the Mission Valley site and leverage that to lure a major league soccer team here. They're looking at building housing, office space, commercial space. Uh, they want to build a river park. Uh, for the city of San Diego, uh, they want to build a sports stadium for the Aztec football team uh, and, and, the, and the soccer team. Uh, then the SDSU West group is, is uh, boosters of SDSU, uh, have kind of taken the vision from the university and they're looking to do much the same in terms of development, significantly less commercial space uh, planned for that project but generally the same in terms of housing and office space, et cetera. Uh, they want to also have a, a sports stadium for the Aztec football team. Um, both of these projects big in terms of dollars, billion dollar projects, um, and uh, there's a lot at stake for each of them. So that's why uh, you've been seeing all the ads that have been on, on television, on the internet, et cetera. And the vote, what happens if uh, one goes and the other one fails, that one goes through? What happens if they both two, pass? Two but, measures on the ballot. Yeah. Um, both measures are on the ballot. The measure that has the most votes over 50% would prevail. Um, if neither measure gets 50% of the vote, they would both fail. The city would be left to figure out what to do in the future. All right, and they differ uh, fairly dramatically. With San Diego State, it's, it's really geared toward uh, uh, an academic thing, expanding the campus. It's not nearly as commercial as the other, right? Explain that. Sure. Um, uh, what the Soccer City folks, the FS investors, are looking to build a sports and entertainment district, and they're going to create that, uh, the, the money needed to build that through the construction of the housing and the office space. Big housing space, elements, et cetera. Too, yeah. Uh, the idea for SDSU West is to have more of a campus-like feel, which means you know instead of having uh, 750,000 square feet of retail space, they're going to have 90,000 square feet of retail space. Um, so it's more of a place for students and the technology park that the uh, university envisions being down there as well. All right, let's get into some of these ads here because it was a very interesting story you had this week and uh, how they're, they're going about this. Uh, first of all, we've got, we're going to hear a bit of the ad from uh, supporting uh, SDSU West. Measure G will transform the Mission Valley Stadium property into a world-class education and research center with a stadium for football and soccer and a beautiful public park along a restored San Diego River. All right, and we've got another one here. This That was the positive one, the good side of that. Then there's a negative ad from SDSU supporters. Let's hear a bit of that. The last thing Mission Valley needs is more traffic. But that's exactly what we'll get with Measure E, the Soccer City proposal. Soccer City doesn't guarantee a major league soccer team, a stadium, or a river park. 
All right, we'll get to a Soccer City ad in a minute here. But, Eric, what's the, the thrust of these ads supporting uh, SDSU? How much is two, spent two, by whom? Two things I think you need to know right off the bat is the first ad was by SDSU West, Friends of SDSU. That's the booster group that put the initiative together and put it on the ballot. The second ad came from uh, two Mission Valley developers, uh, Sudbury Properties and HG Fenton Company, who've raised uh, a little bit, right around $4 million to, to run this long-running negative ad campaign against Soccer City. So there are two groups, but they're sort of working together. In fact, um, last week for the first time, uh, last week for the first time, they issued a joint press release uh, announcing a, a press event. So they had been kind of arm's length, but not now, Jill. Not now. And I, yeah, and to, and to add on to that, um, one of the things that we see is that if the money on two sides of a campaign is fairly even, then the messaging of both sides gets a little bit drowned out, and that's what we're seeing here. The Soccer City campaign has about $7 million. The SDSU West campaign has about $2 million, but those two developers, HG Fenton and Sudbury Properties, are on the attack against the Soccer City group, and they have uh, about $4 million. So you add it up, it's, it's about even. So I think a lot of people are getting ads from both sides, attack ads from both sides, and there's a lot of confusion about what these two plans are because of that. All right, right. There, oh, go oh, ahead. I'm sorry, and there's one other player mm -hmm. in the game that we, I think is worth mentioning. It's the fact uh, that uh, San Diego State University is also running an image campaign. They've put aside $200,000 to run IMSDSU ads. They have billboards the up billboards, in prominent yeah. places. Um, and that's all designed to, to make the community feel better about the university. They can't specifically uh, advocate for Measure G, although they have said that's something they would love to see pass. But they can't specifically advocate for it, but they can uh, have these image ads in the marketplace, uh, you know, and they also are, are, are reaching eyeballs. Okay, Ryan, then I want to get to that Soccer City ad. Yeah, uh, to Jill's point, if it's a wash and both would fail, SDSU sort of wins um, because the investors only have so much patience, one imagines, but SDSU is an entity of the state of California and they can wait for much longer uh, to get a hold of this land, which the city owns and the state could presumably acquire um, over decades. All right, let's get in a little bit from the, uh, the Soccer City ad then. Hey, you want to see the future? Yeah. Whoa. How much does this cost? Won't cost you a dime. Want to see what you get with Measure G? Yeah. Sorry, is this broken? Nope. With Measure G, that's what you get for the next 10 years. And it'll cost you $6 million each year. Who would vote for Measure G? All right, for our radio listeners, they were looking at the stadium and nothing happens, nothing there with the, uh, the opposing measure. And like, a few seconds left. Any polling on this? Any idea how this is going to play out or what's going to happen in our vote in November? I haven't seen any polling on this. Um, I, I know that uh, a lot of people know it's out there and a lot of people are interested and there's a lot of money being spent on both sides to make sure the public is aware. Another reason to vote, another reason to watch and watch KPBS as we record your vote here. Well, we're gonna move on. California is home of the original tax protest, Prop 13. You think a ballot measure to repeal the state's new 12 cent a gallon tax on gasoline might be a cinch to pass, but new polling suggests otherwise here. Uh, and Joe, remind us, what's at stake with, with Prop 6? Well, <clears throat> Proposition 6 is trying to repeal a California state gas tax that was passed last year. It raised the gas tax by 12 cents a gallon and added a new vehicle registration fee. So Prop 6 would repeal that and all of the money collected by the tax, including $1 billion for infrastructure projects here in San Diego, would essentially disappear if it passes. And we've seen some of those projects are already underway and you'll see some of the yes. signs out there, taxpayer uh, dollars at work. Uh, uh, not taxpayer, but uh, gas users, I should say, automobiles and uh, other vehicles. San Diego played a key role in the effort to get this off the ground. Explain that. Well, this all started with Carl DeMaio, who is a former San Diego City Councilman, and he uses his radio talk show here in San Diego to energize and mobilize his listeners. And he's done that. He's mobilized thousands of his listeners to get behind this, and it's become a grassroots campaign. And uh, why do the Prop 6 supporters uh, think uh, more money to improve infrastructure is such a bad idea? Well, they basically say that we can't trust Sacramento to use these dollars wisely. It says, they say Sacramento has a history of taking money that's supposed to be for infrastructure projects and diverting them to pensions and 
filling budget deficits and things like that. So they say this is not going to go to what you think it's going to go to. All right. And um, do we really know where this money is going? Wasn't, weren't there some, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the governor and the legislature and the supporters of the gas tax, didn't they say, hey, we've got some restrictions this time? Yes. So because of this concern, uh, voters in June passed Proposition 69, which essentially puts a lock, lockbox on gas tax funds. So there are some exceptions, but for the most part, it's pretty difficult now to divert those, those funds from the gas tax. All right, and uh, I did say at the outset there was some polling on this one here this week. What are, we, what are we learning there? So what we're learning from the Public Policy Institute of California, the most recent poll we have on the gas tax, is that now we're seeing people are not supporting the gas tax. They we're kind of favoring, uh, the polls show that we're favoring voting against Prop 6, but it is pretty close. And previous polls over the course of the past few months have showed that Prop 6, there's a, sli there's a slight greater chance that it will pass than it won't. So it's pretty close, um, but the fact that we're now seeing voters kind of turn away from Prop 6 a little bit in the polls um, might indicate that some of the money that the that the no on Prop 6 side, the people who like the gas tax, might be working. We have uh, Eric Carl DeMaio on one side of the fence advocating for Prop 6 and repealing the gas tax. Who's on the other side? Who's, who's putting the money there? Well, and those, it's a lot of money, right? It's, it's a lot of money, over $32 million. Carl DeMaio's campaign and the Yes on Six campaign has about $5 million, so it's a, it's a big difference. The side that wants to keep the gas tax, a lot of that funding is coming from, uh, you know, labor unions, construction companies, groups that support, you know, a better economy kind of organizations, um, and frankly, some groups that would benefit from keeping the gas tax around because that money is going to be used for transportation projects and their unions can probably get some work um, going out there and filling the potholes and fixing our roads. Um, so we're seeing a lot of money on that side and like I said that might be an indication that they have the advantage right now because they can reach a lot more voters with their money. And down the stretch that could really uh, really matter. Now <clears throat> you mentioned earlier um, some of the stuff you know, San Diego County is one of the counties and one of the sections of the state that really does benefit from this right? Absolutely, about one-fifth of all the money collected by the gas tax is coming here to San Diego County. Yeah, why is that? Because obviously California is such a huge state and we have, well, I want to say 54 counties, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. but. Well, <coughs> we have a lot of projects and there's just a lot of interest down here in um, improving public transportation and we have a lot of deficit in fixing our roads. Our roads are pretty bad here. So the need is high and we've applied for a lot of money through it and so we've gotten it. And there's an element to this too, with this uh, gas tax in, in place. And if I recall, it's uh, fi about five billion a year that mm -hmm. this raises. It doesn't cover all the infrastructure needs. But one aspect it goes to is public transportation, which brings us back around to the first topic we talked about, which of course is climate change. Yes, uh, public transportation is a part of it. Part of it. It's a little bit controversial. The the yes on six side says, well, why are we funding pro public transportation? This money's supposed to go to road repairs. We shouldn't be using it for light rail and for all these other programs. Um, but obviously there are people who strongly disagree with that and say we need more public transportation. Yeah, Rye, some of the reporting you've done, how important an element in San Diego, for example, is public transportation, getting people out of vehicles and onto uh, more fuel efficient uh, modes of transportation? It's a huge part of our greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, getting cars off the road is, in addition to transforming the grid, the biggest things that we can do as a society. And Ram, are we seeing that around the world where other uh, places, I'm thinking of uh, Europe, for example, where far more public transportation is used right. and gasoline is far more expensive here. I mean, it has a real impact, right? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> uh, transportation is 50 to 60 percent of the total emissions. Uh, I have a different view on this, which is that the issue is we are using the wrong technology, fossil fuels is outdated technology. So if you're using electric electricity for your cars as a power source and generating the electricity as solar, to me it doesn't matter if you drive with your own car to work or take public transportation because you're not contributing to climate pollution. We need to be aware of that. But they are not there yet. So public transportation has to become part of the tool set we have. Yeah. and. Uh, the main issue I find in California, I try to use the bus. There is what's called a last mile problem. It takes me 30 minutes from my house to the bus stop to walk, and then I get the bus. So this is in the field, it's known as the last mile problem. 
and we have not solved that last mile problem in big cities, in European cities. In spite you of all the electric I was going to say, all the <laughs> bird buzzes, buzzers around, yeah. yeah. There, you walk off your apartment, the bus is there. They have solved the last mile problem. We are very close to doing that. But we are not there yet. All right, long way to go. We are out of time, I'm afraid. But another uh, great thing to watch on election night and our election coverage as we go forward. Well, that wraps up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Ram Raman Nathan of the K University of California, San Diego, Eric Anderson of KPBS News, Ry Rivard of Voice of San Diego, and Jill Castellano of iNews Source. And for comprehensive coverage of all the candidates, races, and issues for the November 6th election, check out our election guide at kpbs.org. Got everything you need there, and a lot of links to stories that we do, and a lot of discussions we've had on the roundtable. And again, thanks for joining us today. I'm Mark Sauer. Join us again next week on the roundtable. <laughs> <laughs>